Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Got another great video for you this week from Arizona Worm Farm in Phoenix, in which owner Zach Brooks discusses black soldier fly larva production. Now, this is an absolutely incredible species. They will eat practically any food waste. Seriously, like he gives some examples. They require no water. They are very high in protein, which makes them excellent for uh, chickens or for soil. In fact, they may even have some insect repellent potential in the gardens. And I'll let Zach dive into all of that, but you also get to see the gardens in this video, including their thermal heated greenhouse there at Arizona Worm Farm. Even if you have no interest in black soldier fly larva, you have to check out this greenhouse. It's amazing. Um, otherwise, he gets into some of the numbers and profitability potential of producing black soldier fly larva, uh, and you will walk away with a ton of details about how to produce them. Um, a couple quick notes. This entire video was shot by my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson Roulette, host of the excellent collaborative farming podcast which you should check that out. So huge shout out to him for this work and Zach for his time. Also, this video was paid for in part by a grant from Southern Sayer and made possible like all of our work through the enduring support of our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers. You can always support our work as well by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from no-tillgrowers.com specifically, where the proceeds go to making you more excellent content like this. All right, let's get to it with Zach Brooks of Arizona Worm Farm. So these are live flies. Uh, the black soldier fly is an oversized fly. It doesn't have a mouth. The only stage of the, uh, the uh, insect that eats is the larva stage. It's a male and a female fly. They'll mate and lay eggs, and then they both die. So the live fly only lives for a couple of days. The um, eggs uh, go into a container. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so they'll lay their eggs in between these slats of wood, which is the only hospitable place for them to lay in the whole, in the whole um, container. You can see here these tiny little white things. Those are the flies hatching out of the egg, and they become larvae. They'll go from this size. Um, so they're so small, you can, you can barely even see them. Um, we uh, keep them in here for a couple of days. And then this is what they look like after uh, three to four days. Um, that's literally thousands of black soldier fly larvae. And they're so small that you can put a couple of thousand in your hand. They'll go from this size to full size in another week or so. And they'll eat 50 times their body weight in garbage. Uh, meat or cheese, vegetable waste, any of those kinds of, uh, almost any, they don't eat they don't eat carbon, so they won't eat the bones. You put a whole chicken in there, they'll eat all of the meat off the bone and just leave the, the skeleton behind. Let's see what it's... Okay, so um, these are the full-size larvae. And for someone who wanted to start in the black soldier fly larva uh, business, you would buy a live larva. The, the um, uh, larvae are available in small amounts, which is what I would recommend to anyone because they do multiply so quickly. The larva, we feed them a combination of spent brewer's grain and ground up vegetable waste. Um, and they'll consume this entire thing. They go from microscopic to this size in just a little over a week. When they get ready to pupate, they start to turn black. So they look like that. Um, here's an active, so that's an active larva that's eating aggressively, and that's one that's getting ready to turn into a fly. When they get to be that that color and they slow down their movements, then you have to move them into a, a netting setup, some sort of a cage like the one that we have created. I have successfully raised these in ones as small as the 
butterfly ones you can get on eBay for five or six bucks to those larger um, commercial beds. They'll, they'll pupate uh, over a period of four or five days, become live flies, the flies mate and lay eggs, and then you're off to the races. Each, each pair uh, can produce between five and 700 eggs. So you can get 500 times bigger every single week if you want to, if you just uh, continue to let them pupate and, and become flies and, and have babies. We're producing in this 10-foot uh, shipping container and that 10 by 10 cage, we're producing 200 pounds of larva a week, which we either feed to our, our uh, hens or we sell to other people to feed poultry or, or reptiles. Um, but this space is big. You can see the space is, is pretty empty. The space is big enough for us to produce uh, five or 600 pounds of protein a week. A couple of really cool aspects of the black soldier fly larva. The first is that they'll eat absolutely anything. Pre-consumer, post-consumer, it doesn't matter. Um, we've given them a bucket of McDonald's the, the waste from McDonald's, and they tear through it. And they get bigger and fatter on um, junk food. Uh, so they'll eat absolutely anything, and there's no water added in the process. In fact, we tend to have excess moisture that we drain off. So here in the desert, where it's 120 degrees and we have very little rain, um, we can raise insect protein with no added water. So that's a really big deal. The, the larvae themselves are 40% protein and 10% fat which makes it a tremendous additive feed for any kind of animal. Um, we use them here for our hens, um, but we have customers that use them for dogs and pigs and, um, and other livestock. When I started this farm, I wanted it to be completely sustainable and completely off the grid. I wanted to use just sunshine, rainwater, and other people's garbage to produce food. I wanted the hens, and I thought I was going to raise worms to feed the hens, but that hens eat so many worms and you can't breed them fast enough, you just can't keep up. So we went to the black soldier fly because it's so prolific and so abundant. And it only took us one or two cycles to get this right and now the breeding is like clockwork. Um, it just simply works exactly the way it's designed every single time. And um, our hens just absolutely adore this. So uh, they get, they're on our fields uh, where we're able to grow alfalfa. And so they eat the grasses and grains that we grow. Uh, we give them uh, black soldier fly larva almost every single day. We do supplement them with a little bit of chick feed. The larva itself is probably less than 10% of their feed. Um, the others come from sources either that we grow or buy. But the, 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 the key thing is that it's the protein source. It's what gives us a, a truly magnificent egg, a, a deep, rich orange color, high protein, very flavorful egg. That comes from this added protein. Uh, that's very healthy for the hens. So it's a tropical. It's a tropical insect. Hotter is fine. So in the summer times, these will get 10, 20, 30 degrees warmer and the, and the flies do, do fine. In fact, they breed faster in hotter temperatures. We heat, the, we heat the breeding area in the winter time here, but we don't have to do anything in the summer. If you come to the farm and you want to buy the live larva, we have the live larva available for sale by the pound. Um, some of our customers don't love the fact that it's that they're feeding it, although the hens seem to prefer it live. But if you decide uh, that you want a longer shelf life, or if you decide that you just don't like feeding them the live worms, so this is it. It feels like Rice Krispie treats, and what we've done is just microwaved them and they become shelf stable and they have a, a many year shelf life. And so then you don't have to worry about them pupating, they're not gonna turn into flies, and the hens are they're still attractive treats for the hens. This is the, this is the machine that we bought. It's just an industrial size microwave specifically designed for black soldier flies. Uh, we, can, we can preserve about five pounds in an 11 minute process. So we'll sell you a bag of chicken treats um, for $6.
then that's profitable for us. But I don't have it set up in a process to do it on a full commercial scale. Uh, right now, our cost to produce a pound of black soldier fly larvae is roughly two, two and a half dollars. And on a commercially, on the commercial marketplace, it's worth about a buck and a half. So you can't make that up in volume. Uh, so until the cost of substitutes becomes higher than the cost of producing these insects, or until we do this on a commercial scale where we fully automate the process and bring the cost down, we're not really making money on it. We do it because they'll eat any kind of garbage. We do it because we can transfer the, um, uh, because we use it to feed our, our hens and it gives us a fully self-sustaining way of feeding our hens. So I, 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 it's, an exciting, it's an exciting product and it's one that I think will become a, a real money maker at some point in time. I just don't know what that point in time is. I like the fact that they're super composters. I like the fact that it's a, a high quality protein that we can produce without water. Um, I like the fact that um, it's, they're so prolific. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons to, to, uh, to, to see that as an attractive product. It, uh, profitability is just not one of those reasons yet. The ecoskeleton of the fly itself and their frass, which is the fancy word we give to insect poop, um, if you introduce it to plants in their starter stages, um, it uh, contains an enzyme that tells the plants that there are insects present when there aren't any. So the plant will protect itself from the inside out. It grows stronger, um, thicker cell walls that makes it less hospitable to insects. So uh, we find in our gardens that we have many, many fewer uh, insect issues and fewer disease issues if we, in, if we uh, introduce insect frass into the seed starter mix. So as a byproduct of that, it's a, it's a really, really effective product. Again, those, those larvae go from so small you can't see them to uh, almost an inch in seven or eight days, they're eating a lot and they're not pooping much. So uh, the, the poop is an interesting byproduct, but it, they just don't poop enough for that byproduct by itself to be profitable either. So we use every aspect of it, um, but we're still trying to figure out how to make that a profitable line for us. Our plants will protect themselves from the inside out, and so I don't have to use chemical. I don't use, there's no pesticides, there's no herbicides, there's no commercial fertilizer used in our garden at all. We use a combination of organic methods and inputs to, to create healthy, organic, successful gardens. So this is our garden, um, and I will tell you with 100% honesty that I'm a terrible gardener. I used to be one of those guys that spent $800 on a raised bed in the, my backyard, and I got $300 worth of fancy soil and all kinds of additives, and I'd end up with three sickly tomatoes, um, you know, at an average of $250 a piece by the time I averaged all that out. What I found is if I just got the soil right and then got out of the way, stuff grew. So what you're seeing here is the end product of compost and castings and worms. Um, we have, these are nasturtiums. Uh, it's an edible flower and that leaf size is the largest I've ever seen. We've got um, Brussels sprouts fully fruited out. We have uh, snap peas and broccoli and cauliflower and lettuces. Uh, stuff just grows really, really well. No added, no fertilizers of any kind, just compost and castings in a no-till garden with uh, worms and worm castings that produce the microbes to convert that organic material into what the plants need. My plants are talking to my microbes and the combination of that is producing a, a pretty healthy, abundant growth. And, and I won't tell you that everything out here comes out flawlessly or that it's not a fair amount of work, um, but I believe it's, it's less work, less expensive than adding, chemical, uh, adding, adding chemicals and trying to get that balance right. Our goal here at the farm is to produce a salad for everyone who works here at the farm every single day. And so we have about between 11 and 15 people, depending on the time of year. And uh, so that's so our number one goal is to feed ourselves. The stuff that's left over we sell here uh, on Saturday mornings. Uh, in, in, in the U.S., there's a lot of 
reasons why it's hard to make a market garden hugely profitable. And so that's why we've pivoted to other products. Um, we, we, we grow vegetable starts for people so that they can go home and have their own tomatoes in their own backyard. And we're finding that it's more profitable for us as you know, an, an herb, in an urban setting, urban farm, to, to sell compost and castings and worms and, and vegetable starts than it is to actually sell the vegetables themselves. But I sure like to come out here and eat them. We have two other, we have a, an upper garden, we have a tomato house that's actually um, uh, ground heated. So uh, it's, uh, it uses uh, fans that draw the heat from the top of the greenhouse into the ground and then that heat releases overnight so that you can heat your greenhouse without fossil fuel. Um, and then we have an acre uh, food forest that's got about 118 different varieties of trees in it right now with a goal of having every single, having something giving fruit every single day of the year. And we're 90% there where uh, if you go out into the garden almost any day, any month, there's something that's producing fruit that you can eat. And that's just going to keep getting better and better. No fertilizers compost, castings, worms. This is drawing uh, hot air from the top of the greenhouse. Our sensor tells me right now it's going in at 95 degrees. So it comes in at 95 degrees and it grows down underneath six feet under the ground. It goes into a lattice work, a lattice of two inch pipes that are perforated with a sock over them that run underneath the greenhouse to the center to another set of, of uh, pipes that size and pops out over there. The heat is absorbed by the ground as that air passes through the ground, comes out 30 to 40 degrees cooler during the daytime. That heat is absorbed by the soil and released overnight. So it'll keep the greenhouse uh, 20 to 30 degrees warmer than the ambient temperature, even in the coldest parts of the winter. It's a very, very simple system. The only moving parts are two fans. Everything else and, and thermostats, but, but that's it. Two fans uh, is all it takes to, to operate this um, uh, GHAT, ground heated uh, greenhouse. So this banana has been in the ground nine months and it's already fruited. Um, this put out this rack of bananas uh, just a little over three weeks ago. And I called my banana guru and I said, when can I eat those bananas? And he said, well, uh, you better wait or your stomach and your toilet are going to hate you. Um, but you need to wait about 90 days for it to get ripe. And so I come out here every day and check and see if they're yellow and they're not yet. But uh, somewhere over the next four to six weeks, we ought to have um, ripe bananas. But these guys went in at less than three feet. And there's just something about that heated ground that they absolutely adore. And so they've taken off like crazy. And we've pulled a number of pups out just because we don't want it to get overwhelmed. Um, but again, the, 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 like with the soldier flies where you can grow protein without water, the advantage here is that you can heat this place without fossil fuels. You don't need a, a gas heater pumping heat in here overnight. We have the advantage of Arizona, in Arizona, of not having super cold nights. So a hard frost for us means 25 or 28 degrees. But if I can keep the temperature 20 or 30 degrees above that, I can grow this stuff all year round without fossil fuels. Uh, GHAT, ground heated, uh, a, a GAT is what this is called. I didn't invent it, I, 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 I just put it in. And the idea of using thermal heating to heat the ground to advance either to accelerate when you can plant seeds and, and harvest earlier. First to market always gets a premium on, on produce and products um, or be able to heat something like a greenhouse or, or a wind tunnel uh, without any ongoing expense um, is important. It, it, this is an expensive, it's more expensive to put this in day one um, than it is to just hang up an oil heater. But the ongoing costs are, again, if you put in the right kind of solar panels and the right kind of fans, the costs, the ongoing costs are, are zero. All right, I hope you enjoyed that video. There will be links and all that good stuff in the show notes. And you can also find us and Arizona Worm Farm on Instagram and all the places. Again, you can support our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers or by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com specifically where the proceeds go to making us make you more content like this. 
Check out the other videos we did with Zach, including this one on their composting operation and this other one on their vermicompost and worm breeding. Uh, I also did a podcast episode with Zach earlier this year, which you can listen to right here on YouTube by following this link or searching wherever you get podcasts for the No-Till Market Garden podcast. Um, otherwise, like this video if you like this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. It's so weird to shoot a video in the sun.